The story unfolds over 13 issues, which was not done back then. This was not really done in comics. The 13 issue story like arc didn't really happen back then when it was hard to find comics. It's cool that it happened, but it was really you're trusting people are going to be able to find these comics and follow the story. Welcome to another chapter in the Omnibus where lore analysis and understanding come together this week, Afrofuturism and the Black Panther. The Black Panther and Wakanda are an early example of Afrofuturism, which is a, a term coined by cultural critic Mark Derry in his 1993 essay, Black to the Future, which explored the paucity of black creators in sci-fi. Filmmaker and scholar Yatasha L. Womack in her book Afrofuturism, the World of Black Sci-Fi and Fantasy Culture, defines the movement as, quote, both an artistic aesthetic and a framework for critical theory that, quote, combines elements of science fiction, historical fiction, speculative fiction, fantasy, Afrocentricity, and magic realism with non-Western beliefs. Some other examples of Afrofuturism that you might be aware of are the works of Jean-Michel Basquiat. Uh, the Jimi Hendrix experience, Parliament Funkadelic's kind of like UFO aesthetic and lore, the works of Octavia Butler, uh, and the late rapper MF Doom. Wakanda is the most technologically advanced superpower on Earth in the MCU, uh, a utopia melding supercomputers, incredible weapons, spaceships, uh, with fictional African traditions, uh, the Orisha, the heart-shaped herb, Warrior Falls, and so on. At a time when racial caricaturing of non-white characters was commonplace, see any of Marvel Comics or any comics at all, DC Comics, anybody, as uh, 1960s depiction of Asian characters and, and any character of color, really. Uh, Kirby and Lee avoided such pitfalls with the creation of T'Challa. Quote, without a doubt, uh, Loyola professor Adilifu Nama writes in his book, Super Black American Pop Culture and Black Superheroes, um, the Black Panther and Wakanda offered unprecedented and upbeat images of Africa and African people. When uh, Reed Richards, among, of course, the most very brilliant minds in the Marvel Universe, first encounters Wakandan technology, uh, he's blown away. Quote, he took a metal device from inside his toga. Uh, Reed says in Fantastic Four number 52, but it's so small. Can he actually transmit a message halfway around the globe with that? Uh, as radical as the intersection of technology and blackness is, the presentation of Wakanda as a nation which has time and again successfully defended itself from European invasion and colonization. Wakanda compels respect from the world's great nations, uh, its superheroes, and its supervillains. The nation has no history of colonial trauma to transcend. Wakanda's existence as a free, self-sufficient geopolitical power is a powerful critique of colonialism and the economic exploitation of Africa. The introduction of Ulysses Claw sharpens that point. A Belgian mercenary, son of a Nazi war criminal, Claw, the Black Panther's nemesis, is obsessed with obtaining Wakanda's vibranium. T'Challa's origin story, rising from the title of Black Panther after beating back Claw's murderous assault on his nation, is, as Nama writes, quote, the idealized composite of third world black revolutionaries and the anti-colonialist movement of the 1950s that they represented. The first Black Panther film calls on numerous elements from T'Challa's comics canon, the most notable uh, being for me, Panther's Rage and the Client. The former is a storyline, uh, which is an epic storyline written by Don McGregor with art by Rick Buckler, uh, Billy Graham and Gil Kane, which played out in the pages of uh, Black Panther's solo book, then embarrassingly titled Jungle Action from September 1973 to November 1975. Rosie, tell us more about uh, Bill Graham. Yeah, Panther's Rage is a really monumental book, not just because it's widely seen as one of the best arcs of Black Panther, but also uh, it was drawn predominantly by Billy Graham, who is arguably the first Black creator who was hired by the big two. Um, the book also had a Black uncredited assistant on it, uh, Arvel Jones, and Billy Graham had already done work at Marvel because he had inked the first ever issue of Luke Cage Hero for Hire in 1972 and continued to ink or pencil that book through its first 16 
issues. One of the things that's most memorable about Billy's art on Panther's Rage are these unbelievable title pages he would draw with these huge names written out of rock. And Billy has long been an undercredited part of Marvel history. So it's really wonderful to see people revisit Panther's Rage and learn about the impact that Billy and his art had on Black Panther and this landmark arc. Um, the Client uh, is an arc written by Christopher Priest with art by Mark Teixeira, not the baseball player. Uh, part of a character redefining run on the Black Panther solo title, which was first published in the late 90s and is just tremendously influential, like unbelievably influential. Um, in Panther's Rage, T'Challa, back in Wakanda after many years in the States, is struggling to adapt to a nation that has kind of been, uh, is in the midst of kind of coming apart because of palace intrigue and he's trying to balance his love life and also his responsibilities as a, as a leader. Uh, and he faces his most dangerous nemesis yet, a Wakandan named and Jadaka, who spent time in America, changed his name to Eric Killmonger. Uh, Panther's Rage was uh, groundbreaking comic storytelling. The story was set completely in Africa, in Wakanda, far from the urban settings in which most, you know, kind of mainstream media mm -hmm. stories set in a, a black context were told. Uh, and it was, quote, at a time when strident expressions of black cultural pride were cresting in the United States, writes Nama and Super Black. The story unfolds over 13 issues, which was, this was not done back then. This was not really done in comics, a 13 issue story, like arc didn't really happen back then when it was hard to find comics. Like you didn't know, most people got them off the rack. There were not that many comic stores. And so to do a 13 issue arc was really, it was an investment and it was, uh, and it was, it's cool that it happened, but it was really, you're trusting people are going to be able to find these comics and follow the story. Um, it has been described as Marvel's first graphic novel. Uh, the Kree Skrull War, for instance, which was published in 1971-72, was told over eight issues in the pages of the Avengers. Uh, Panther's Rage features, with one exception, the villain uh, Venom, an all-black cast, a first for mainstream comics. In their first confrontation... Killmonger tosses the Black Panther over Warrior Falls, declaring your line of descent and you'll take nothing from me ever again. Goodbye, great and mighty king. You've returned to the land of your birth only to die here. Uh, T'Challa bounces back uh, from this defeat much quicker than he does in the first Panther film. But this, the, you know, this defeat really shakes T'Challa to his core and in subsequent issues he faces various challenges to his authority. Uh, Christopher Priest, who in 1983 became the first black writer to be hired at the big two comic houses, Marvel and DC, began writing Black Panther in 1998. Uh, at this time, uh, this was a, a, a really tenuous time in comics writ large, and in particularly at Marvel, which was just then emerging from bankruptcy after the kind of collectibles wide bust of the early to mid aughts that included comics, included Beanie Babies, included trading cards, et cetera. All those things just tanked. And the company at that time was just kind of willing to try shit, just throw anything at the wall and see if anything came of it. One of those things was a new line of edgier comics branded as Marvel Knights, K-N-I-G-H-T-S. Editors Joe Quesada and Jimmy Palmiotti uh, approached Priest about Black Panther. Uh, Christopher was initially uh, hesitant to do it, but he accepted. Uh, and it was a transformational run, breathing new energy into the character and lore. Quote, he had the classic run on Black Panther, period. And that's going to be true for a long time. Ta-Nagisi Coates, Black Panther uh, writer and now Superman writer, told Vulture's Abraham Raisman in 2018. Priest brought a, uh, a real kingly weight to T'Challa's character uh, uh, contrasts this with Panther's Rage where uh, T'Challa was more unsure of his leadership and, and how to wield it uh, uh, in priest telling T'Challa was a leader, was a king, was a ruler and exuded that confidence. Uh, in the client, he just commands total respect. And while Priest did not create the Blank Panther, it's it's really, in many ways, his version of the character. 
that you see in the Marvel universe, in the MCU. Priest and artist Mark Teixeira tell the tale in a, a kind of uh, jumbled, fractured style that feels, you know, very Quentin Tarantino-esque, very of the time period of the 90s. Uh, the, the, it's about the Tomorrow Fund, which is a kind of project to create affordable housing um, in kind of downtrodden urban areas. It's been revealed as a cover for a money laundering operation for drug money. Um a young girl who appears in the fund's ad with T'Challa is murdered, and uh, despite tensions arising for war refugees sheltering Wakanda, uh, the king travels to the U.S. to try and figure out, like, okay, what's going on with this t- uh, tomorrow fund? And to, to you know, like, uh, to bring those responsible to justice. He's accompanied by his personal bodyguards, Nakia and Okoye, members of the elite all-female fighting force known as the Dora Milaje. Uh Quote, the concept of the Dora Milaje, Wakandan for adored ones, evolved out of the brilliant work of Panther scribe Don McGregor, who theorized Wakanda was actually made up of a great many indigenous tribes and that not all the tribes liked each other, Priest writes on his website, digitalpriest.com. Quote, Joe and Jimmy just thought it'd be cool to have Panther travel with a pair of six foot tall, gorgeous women. And I certainly agreed. (laughs) But the order of the Dora Milaje, a kind of nun wife in training deal, gave us a foot in both the worlds the Panther struggled to maintain peace between the modern and the tribal, end quote. The story is told mainly through the recollections of one colonizer, <laughs> Everett Ross, CIA agent Everett Ross, a kind of, uh, in the comics, a mid-level State Department bureaucrat who's ostensibly assigned to T'Challa as his kind of like point of contact with the U.S. government, um, but whose actual job is to spy on him. Uh, Priest's inspiration for Ross was, (laughs) hilariously, Chandler Bing from Friends and Alex P. Keaton from the 1980s uh, uh, sitcom uh, Family Ties. The inclusion of Ross as a narrator was this really subversive uh, moment. Quote, with Ross in place, the book began to take shape. Priest writes on digitalpriest.com. Quote continues, Ross became the key to making the book work. He was the voice of the average Marvel reader who in no doubt wondered why Marvel was bothering with another Panther series. Ross's monologues began to steal the show, offsetting the mysterious night creature, the man of few words, who Ross was attached to. The monologues were often outrageous with Ross interpreting the Marvel universe through his everyman's eyes rather than through the eyes of someone who's been reading comics all their life. It was a new voice, one seemingly hostile towards the Marvel universe and by extension its fans, but actually the intent is to be a social observer and a deconstructionist, end quote. And as Namo notes in Super Black, quote, the Ross figure provides the reader with the choice of identifying with either the white figure or the black superhero, or both of them, but never exclusively with the black protagonist. In this sense, Ross's character is a nifty technique for addressing whether or not white readers will identify with a black superhero, namely T'Challa. By the mid-2000s, Priest had burned out at Marvel frustrated uh, by a lack of opportunities to write A-list characters. Quote, I've mentioned this a lot in interviews, Priest told uh, CBR.com in 2020. But long story short, somehow bizarrely, as a result of my writing Black Panther, a comic book about the cultural awakening of a white man named Ross, I stopped being a writer and somehow became a black writer, offered only writing assignments for characters of color, end quote. Priest returned to comics in 2016 when DC offered him the writing duties on Deathstroke as part of the company's rebirth launch. That title ended in 2019, and uh, as early as 2021, Priest was working on uh, the relaunch of Vampirella for Dynamite Comics. Okay, and this is actually incredible because Billy Graham's first known credited work was actually on a Vampirella comic uh, illustrating Don Glut in Vampirella I think it was number one in 1969, and he would go on to actually uh, pencil nearly like a dozen stories and and ink uh, Vampirella stories. So it's kind of amazing that there's also that connection between what Priest is doing now and then where Billy found a home at the beginning of his career. 